Good afternoon to you all and a very warm welcome to our webinar today on the AI Act and what does it mean for Europe's competitiveness. Joyce O'Connor here, Chair of the Digital Group at the IIEA. And it's my great pleasure to welcome our distinguished speaker today, Kai Zenner, who's the Head of Office and Digital Policy Advisor to Axel Voss MEP. Kai, you're very, very welcome. We're delighted that you've taken time out of your busy schedule. You were telling me beforehand that you've had, was it five or seven international trips uh, around uh, Europe and Korea? So we're really pleased to have you with us today and very, it's very much appreciated. Great to have you here. So Kai will speak to us for 20 to 25 minutes or so, and then I will go to you, our audience, for the Q&As and using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And please feel free to send any questions or comments in during Kai's presentation, and I'll come to them after he finishes speaking. And it would be great if you give your name and designation when you're asking a question. Thank you very much for that. A reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are recorded and are on the record. And please feel free to join the discussion on X using the handle at the IIEA. The AI Act can be seen as the second generation of digital laws in Europe. In 1020, Europe started this regulatory journey with the agenda for the digital decade and the first as the first generation. For the AI Act, European policymakers took a principle-based and transparency approach to the development of the Act involving stakeholders, all stakeholders such as business, academia and civil society. The EU has initiated public-private partnerships such as regulatory sandboxes, the scientific panel, the advisory forum and a cooperation mechanism for stakeholders with the AI office in terms of a future-oriented and flexible regulatory framework. The AI Act focuses on the entire value chain. Zai Zemmer brings a unique perspective to the shaping and the developing of the AI Act. He will discuss the EU's AI Act and outline the risks-based approach, its implications for different levels of the AI value chain. He will also assess what he sees to be the positive and negative features of the Act. He'll have a special focus, as I said, earlier for the implications of the AI Act for EU's competitiveness, including both the opportunities and the risks. He will ask the question, what can we do now to make sure that the AI Act will be a positive success story? And as I think he will say, Kai, the clock is ticking. What can we do as stakeholders now? So the focus is on stakeholders not just the institutions and the legal aspects. And I think Kai will give us some answers to those questions. As I said, we're really privileged to have Zai with us today. He graduated in political science from Edinburgh and the University of Brenham and in law from the University of Munster. Before moving to the European Parliament, he worked as a research associate at the European office of the Conrad Eisenhower, or not Conrad uh, I. Adenauer Foundation in Brussels. He is a member of the OECD AI Network of Experts since 2021 and was awarded the best assistant in 2023, going above and beyond his duties as in that position and ranked placed 13th as one of the in the Politico's Power 40 class as one of the top influencers who are most effectively setting the agenda in politics, public policy and advocacy in, in Brussels. Kai, as I said, is head of office and digital policy advisor for MEP Axel Voss from the European People's Party Group and the Parliament. He's a digital enthusiast. He focuses on AI, data and the EU's digital transition currently is involved in political negotiations on the AI Act, AI uh, Liability Directive, e-privacy regulation and GDPR revision. 
in his individual capacity, he advocates for within the European Parliament and for bringing back the better regulation agenda to EU policymaking. Kai, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Joyce, for those um, kind words and also um, yeah, for inviting me and for uh, giving me the chance to um, share a little bit my thoughts and ideas um, around the AI Act. Indeed, as you said, I was heavily traveling in particular um, after the AI Act um, has been adopted because um, Axel Foss, my um, boss and uh, myself, um, really felt that it would be good to, on top of the Commission's um, statements, to give a little bit more insight what has happened, why certain things um, are now in the final text, also to um, single out certain um, certain problems that could, um, yeah, could um, occur now that the AI I act is slowly being implemented. And most of all, um, what um, Axel and I um, in parallel tried to, um, to say on all those different events was really um, that stakeholders should be heavily engaged, in particular in comparison to the GDPR, where in 2018 um, most um, companies were really surprised that suddenly there are new data protection rules. Um, with the AI Act, we wanted to uh, tell everyone to start already now to prepare um, in, uh, with regard to compliance, with regard to uh, building up certain governance um, um, uh, yeah, infrastructure and so on and so on. Um, I will share now my screen because I will and show you a few slides. If there is any problems um, with the slides, um, just give me a sign because sometimes our um, parliament uh, firewall is making some problems. So now basically you should see my slides. Um, um, Joyce was already um, giving a little bit of background and um, just maybe one addition and um, I was indeed heavily involved um, on the AI negotiations um, with my boss um, from the very beginning involved in um, AI policy frameworks and then in particular um, on the AI Act um, as Axel Foss was uh, the shadow rapporteur for the EPP group. Um, and Joyce was also um, giving already a little bit of um, background um, why the AI Act is there, um, that it's part of a larger strategy. And I want to go even a bit further um, in terms of, um, let's call it historic background um, of the AI Act, because I think it's very, very important, in particular, if you are um, rather critical with the AI Act to better understand why it's suddenly there. Um, as I said, we need to go back in history a little bit um, because actually the, the beginning of uh, the whole AI strategy can be find, uh, found in uh, 2016, 2017. Back then, the European Parliament initiated um, one uh, report, a so-called own initiative report, where we as Parliament said, um, look, especially with machine learning, deep learning, AI technologies, there are certain um, legal problems, certain um, issues that probably needs an um, uh, legislative um, response. And back then, what you see on uh, this slide about digital competitiveness, there was already the realization in Europe that um, in digital in general, but in particular on AI, the European Union is really lacking behind, meaning that um, the United States and China in technological terms are far ahead. Um, if you, for example, um, compare the um, VC um, yeah, the level of uh, VC density and also the amount of money that uh, VCs are um, putting into AI technologies. Um, already in 2018, 17, um, Europe was far behind. We were very bad in commercializing our good research um, results and so on and so on. Actually, everything that you have read now in the Draghi report was already 
on paper in 2018. And China was catching up with the United States and also going more and more away from um, the state of um, digital economy or AI economy compared to Europe. The big idea back then was similar to the GDPR to trigger a Brussels effect, meaning that um, <clears throat> at least um, we, on regulatory terms, Europe um, could become a leading voice and internally for our companies um, could create a competitive edge by um, establishing um, a, a legal framework that um, brings companies um, a lot of legal certainty so that even though in technological terms um, here and there are problems or we don't have the best technology, at least companies know exactly what to do, what is allowed, what is not allowed, and maybe also be able to create technology made in Europe that is particular safe, is um, very good in um, in terms of uh, uh, privacy and so on and so on. This was the origin of the AI Act and of a lot of other um, legal, um, um, sorry, um, digital um, laws that um, you saw over the last months um, in this kind of uh, yeah uh, second wave of uh, digital laws that Joyce was also um, talking about. What is important, what you see now on the third slide, um, that um, those ideas that we are focusing now on those potential legal gaps when it comes to machine learning and deep learning is not something that only um, came up in Europe. Um, again, with what we try to um, create another Brussels effect, but um, different to, to privacy, where it was really something that was mainly coming from Europe on AI policy, it was really an international um, exercise. Um, already in the 2010s, um, many of those um, international op organizations and fora that you see um, in this graphic were actually um, yeah, actively working um, on the question what technologies um, are now um, posing for risk what um, legislators across the world need to do. And um, they were actually able to conclude, um, to find um, an aligned position among very, very different um, areas uh, across the world from Canada, United States, even to India and China. What you can um, see on this slide is, um, for example, the 2019 um, OECD um, principles that didn't stay in this more Western OECD, but actually were adopted from um, G20, including China, including India. And especially the um, left side is showing you um, yeah, some more, let's call it ethical principles that indeed, as I just said, you can nowadays find in the executive order of the United States, in the AI bits of rights, in the Canadian AIDA law, in the Brazilian's AI laws, in the European AI Act, but even in the non-legislative um, AI policies or measures, for example, in Japan, in, um, in Singapore, or also in the Chinese AI laws, which is, if you compare it to a lot of other areas in the world where we are constantly fighting against each other and not able to align on anything, is, I would say, a rather positive um, development and in the future will also help to build up some international alignment because at least the principles in the to be fair, very different policy um, options that different regions took. At least the principles um, are the same. Where I was now speaking about um, yeah, different approaches around the world, what is really um, unique um, for the European Union? And this is going back to my first slide on digital competitiveness that you saw. Europe tried, as I already said, 
to establish a kind of third way on AI, something that is um, creating a very, very um, strict um, framework or coherent framework, um, which in the end is um, giving um, end users, deployers, but also developers um, enough legal certainty um, to um, use AI, to develop AI, to deploy AI, and to kind of create a competitive edge by um, building or using something that cannot be found in a similar way across the world. So for example, as I said already, um, AI technologies that are in particular safe, that are in particular um, um, good in terms of privacy and so on and so on. This whole third way on AI was mainly, um, or can be mainly summarized um, in four um, pillars. First of all, we wanted to create AI that is in particular ethical and trustworthy. We didn't want to regulate everything with AI, but really wanted to focus based on a risk-based approach on um, those AI technologies that are in particular risky or not in line with our European values. We wanted to increase the level of safety, make it very clear how liabilities um, um, are, who should be liable for what. And even though we have those three very um, EU unique um, marks, we still wanted to have strong international cooperation, strong alignment with those principles that you see here on the left side. If I'm now going even more in the specifics um, of the European AI Act, um, three points are really, really unique and um, really, yeah, spring out if you compare the AI Act with other pieces um, of AI policy. First of all, it's a product safety legislation approach of the European Union, where we took um, some um, mechanisms that uh, worked very well in the past um, in areas like toys, like radio equipment, like medical devices, and so on and something that most of our European companies are very used to because they are already doing CE markings. They know already how to do conformity assessments, to whom to go if they need to do a third party conformity assessment and so on. So it's really in kind of ecosystem that is closed in itself where everyone knows what to do and what is coming. And of course, by choosing something that is so much established, um, normally, the cost, the additional compliance cost should be rather low because you just need to um, yeah, adjust a little bit what you already have in place. So again, by uh, um, merging those two fields, um, you are creating just a, a lot of uncertainty because it's really two um, separated fields that so far have no experience to work with each other. And um, you are also now protecting fundamental rights, something that um, so far was never something that producer needed to consider when they are creating um, a product. So already here, a good idea, but a big question mark. And um, also the second um, crucial um, yeah, let's say difference if you if you look to other AI policies around the world, the risk-based approach, which I said already, is also rather innovation friendly because um, it only strongly regulates um, AI technologies that could be categorized either as unacceptable risk or high risk. Um, and by doing that, really focusing on a small number um, of AI technologies in theory. The big problem here is similar to NLF, it's a very good idea, but in practice, the big issue here is that the EU didn't really do enough um, research on this point. The commission created these um, risk categories, um, but yeah, honestly, they probably just had a feeling that AI technologies in those areas could become risky because some of those um, 
um, categories or use cases that they, for example, listed it in Article 5 on prohibitions or in Annex 3 in the list of high-risk uh, use cases are not really commercialized. Um, so, for example, in border management, there is a lie detector driven by AI technology and the press has asked all 27 member states and no one from them is using something like that or is planning to use it. And this you see in a lot of those use cases that are either um, prohibited in the future or put under high risk. So actually the whole AI Act is a little bit a uh, shot in the dark. And um, even if you check the risk categories, as uh, they are written so vaguely um, that, yeah, no company is really um, knowing right now um, what is actually now um, yeah, applicable uh, to our specific um, technology. So also here, unfortunately, a huge question mark. The third and last um, unique point um, of the uh, European AI Act is our value chain approach. Again, similar to the two other um, unique um, conceptual points of the EU AI Act. Also, this one is something I truly believe um, to be very useful in theory. It's actually something the European Parliament pushed um, very much because we were feeling that um, in particular digital laws of the first generation, but also some of the second generation of um, the EU we're always focusing on um, the downstream um, companies. So those companies that we are putting a lot of components together and commercialize the final end product. Um, this would be also the case with a normal NLF um, um, approach and the um, original um, commission proposal for the AI Act. So it would be again the downstream provider of a high-risk AI system, for example, and the deployer of such system that would feel all the regulatory burden and would be often left alone to become compliant because there is not even information sharing from upstream companies. And this we in the European Parliament in particular wanted to solve. We created or extended the Article 25 in the final AI Act, but also added the chapter on foundation models with the clear um, objective to accelerate information sharing along the value chain to make sure that those companies that um, would um, be the focus of AI Act compliance would have all the information necessary, but also would receive some uh, technical assistance from um, upstream um, companies. While again, we are still convinced that this is extremely important and very happy that it's in the final AI Act. There is this problem that, um, yeah, it was a very, very swiftly negotiated um, point and um, it's heavily depending on um, secondary legislation, on guidelines, on uh, the code of practice, on standard contractual clauses that are being developed from the commission and so on. All of that is not there. We don't know when it's coming. We don't know if the quality is high enough. So also here, unfortunately, a big question mark. And this brings me to this kind of um, overview of pros and cons of the European AI Act, um, which you heard probably already from what I'm, uh, what I have said, that there is a lot of positive, a lot of negative. Um, let me start with the positive points. I said already, it's one of the first European digital laws where we really cared about the international alignment, where we really tried to make sure that um, it's not something too specific, uh, just working for European companies. That, for example, that the risk management um, is very close to um, those approaches that are being developed in OECD, that are developed by our friends from the US NIST agency, and so on. We also, um, like it was already um, being said, have created a law that is rather principle-based, also something that is not really normal for European laws. 
I spoke a lot about burden sharing along the AI value chain, trying to help downstream providers to, um, yeah, to have easier compliance. And the last two positive points is that we created a law that is much more accessible and probably future proof. What I mean by that is that we created a lot of additional mechanism which allow stakeholders to um, inform uh, the commission, inform the national competent authorities um, about certain needs that um, or certain technological developments um, on the market that should be considered um, in the AI Act and should be taken on board and lead to some adjustments. So there will be constantly new delegated X, implementing X, um, technical standards via Sensenelec will be also adjusted nonstop. So we will really see probably a law that is not like the GDPR being um, or becoming applicable and then staying applicable in the same way for many years. The AI Act will probably constantly change which is a good thing because, as we all know, AI technology is something very dynamic. And the AI Act, and this brings me to the negative point, is really one of the first laws that is trying to capture something that is so dynamic um, as AI. And I talked already a lot about new legislative framework, product safety. There is a big question mark if those um, very fixated uh, stare um, unflexible new legislative framework approaches are actually working for something that is evolving, is changing. It could happen that if we are uh, strictly applying NLF um, uh, concepts, that it would mean that uh, companies uh, would need to do new conformity assessments nonstop. They would need to adjust their technical documentation all the time and so on. We also created another negative point, a horizontal um, framework for AI that is colliding with a lot of existing legislation that is partially at least also regulating um, AI. Um, for example, GDPR, for example, DSA, for example, platform work directive, but also sectorial medical device regulation, machinery regulation, and so on. All those laws have also their own enforcement bodies, governance bodies. And what we are afraid about is that there is at least in the next months and next years, a lot of competition or unclarity how those legal frameworks, how those governance mechanisms um, will work together. As I said already, a lot of parts in the AI Act are also rather vague, um, unclear procedures, um, the risk case uh, high risk cases, the prohibitions are um, blurry. It's not really clear what is meant. And this means, in summary, the AI Act is a big step forward. We are really trying out a lot of new things um, in order to create much more future proof laws. But unfortunately, in the basics, or when it comes to the basics, uh, writing a law that is very coherent with existing law, writing a law in a way um, where the language, the wording is very clear, there we unfortunately as legislator failed and um, left a law that is at least right now um, creating way too much um, legal vagueness. Because I already, at the very end of my time, very shortly, just um, over a few points um, that I still wanted to make. Um, also, when it comes to governance, we created a lot of um, new approaches. We created a lot of um, expert groups, as I said already, that uh, should be very helpful in order to, um, yeah, to keep the regulator updated to change certain things if the technology is changing or the market is changing. When it comes to the governments in the commission and very likely also in the national as in the national member states, it is unfortunately the case right now that the governance structures there are very outdated and therefore together with um, Sebastian Heinzleben from San Senelec and a professor I created this overview for a future AI office which would 
be more capable um, to to cover something that is so dynamic um, like AI. We were talking here, as you can see, about agile working, taking a little bit those project teams from um, big consultancy or law firms, um, thinking about um, yeah, um, a strong leadership that is not political, that is internationally um, very active, talking about openness or so involving stakeholders, being very clear with steps that are happening. Unfortunately, right now, in reality, it's not looking like that. Um, in certain parts, the AI office made also um, major improvements, but from our, let's say, more bolder vision, it's still far ahead. And as I said, um, two other problems that I just wanted to visualize is really all those overlaps um, with existing legislation um, that are partially already um, covering AI. I um, mentioned already what are the um, negative side effects, but in this slide you see um, this high number um, of um, applicable laws, 87 in June 2024, um, it's now already more. And um, I think for most companies, it's really a nightmare to navigate at the moment uh, through this field, especially if um, in this um, slide you see that there is also a complete unclarity which actor is now um, actually the entity that you should reach out to. Because, for example, on finance and AI, there are strong arguments now to say that it's still the ECB and EBA and other financial authorities to, uh, who are on the lead, the AI office from the AI Act, will, however, say, no, it's us who are responsible. And with all of that, to my last slide, and then I'm finishing, um, if you are now remembering what I said about... Um, yeah, yeah, Europe trying to create um, a legal framework that is bringing um, strong legal certainty, allowing our companies to create um, AI technologies made in Europe. It's something that we really tried that could maybe still be um, the case in two, three, four, five years, but where we, my boss Axel Foss and I are extremely worried about is really this period in between from now until we figured out how the AI Act is working. Why we are so concerned? It's mainly those four bombs that I um, painted here or draw up here. First of all, we really are afraid that most companies will hesitate and invest in um, AI or to uh, develop AI because of all this legal uncertainty that they don't really understand how to interpret the um, AI Act and in particular German companies don't invest if there is not uh, legal certainty. We have those legal question marks that I was talking lengthy about it. If the law is actually working for something so dynamic like AI if the evidence um, was strong enough for the AI Act, maybe the third bomb, it's also creating a situation where even those companies that are willing to take a risk to invest, to develop AI, cannot really do it themselves, but that they need uh, or they rely on very expensive third-party conformity assessment, auditing, certification, which again, makes big for accounting firms very rich, but um, would definitely stifle innovation if it means that without um, those uh, huge additional costs, you cannot really develop um, it on your own. And the fourth bomb is, especially in the first months and years, we really don't see how the European Commission and especially smaller member states are finding enough AI talent for their own um, governance authorities, for their own um, yeah, AI agencies or however they are calling it, because competition is fierce. Um, um, AI experts can get a lot more money if they are working for companies like Microsoft and so on. And um, the, Bulgarian com um, the Bulgarian National Competent Authorities is, of course, um, yeah, in, in competition with those large tech companies. And 
honestly, I don't see right now how a country like Bulgaria will find um, suffic a sufficient number um, of AI experts for a sound um, uh, mechanism on the national level. And already for the commission, it's a huge problem. And so far, the building up of the AI office um, is extremely slow and they are much behind the original schedule. So this is another bomb that actually the public authorities are not um, able, at least at the beginning, to um, fulfill um, all of their plans that uh, they had. So sorry for being um, over time, but um, this would be my presentation and I'm looking very much forward um, to the questions and on this slide you see my contact details. If we don't um, talk about your questions, you can gladly also send me something after our event. Mm -hmm.